We're having great difficulty getting aid into Gaza now. If Rafa was attacked and if Rafa closed, it would be even more difficult. We don't think uh, there is anywhere safe for people to move within Gaza. Uh, so the idea of evacuating them to some place of safety, we think is illusory. Are you saying this to Israeli officials and what are they saying in response? We are saying it to Israeli officials. We have, in fact, to, to their great credit, um, daily discussions with them uh, in Israel. Um, they are saying, of course, uh, please try and evacuate the people to somewhere else where there is where they may be safe. Is there clarity that, as to where that might be, though? No, not in my view. Um, there aren't any uh, places where you can put your hand on your heart and say, this is a safe place to move. It is also important to note that it is not our choice whether people move or not. It is their choice. They have a right to move. They have a right to decide where to move and where not to move. I mean, obviously, based on um, any sort of international law, they have the right to choose where they go. But, yeah. but in reality, they don't. If you're talking about our role in this, we are not going to participate, as you know, because we've said it publicly often enough, in any forcible movement of people. Um, we will certainly help people if they decide to go somewhere of their own volition and if we think it's safe. But we do not think that there is anywhere safe to go in Gaza. What is your number one priority now, Mr Griffiths, when it comes to Gaza? What is the one thing that keeps you up at night? What is it the one thing that you want to achieve? The one thing that keeps me up at night is whether the choice will be made to attack Rafa. You've been doing this for five decades, for, for the bulk of your life, and you have described the situation in Gaza as the worst humanitarian crisis that you've seen. I mean, that is a, a sort of a massive statement given what you've seen throughout your life and career. Yeah, it's, it's not that I haven't seen terrible atrocities, as you can imagine, in places like Syria. I remember awful scenes that I was obliged to witness and take note of there. It's not as if the Khmer Rouge were not the horrors of their day at my, in my youth. But the reason I said that Gaza is, in my experience, the worst is because people can't escape. Um, they're blocked in. You've talked about being a mediator and you've mediated with, with so many different factions and groups, um, terrorist organizations over the years that have uh, come to the negotiating table. In terms of Israel's plan to eliminate Hamas and have them never be part of any future negotiation when it comes to Gaza, do you think that's realistic? I think it's very difficult. And as you say, I've, I've worked with many, many, many different terrorists and, and, and insurgent groups. Uh, Hamas is not a terrorist group for, for us, of course, as you know, it's a political movement. But I think it's very, very difficult to dislodge these groups without a negotiated solution, uh, which includes their aspirations. I cannot think of an example offhand um, of, a, a, of, of a place where a victory from through warfare has succeeded against a well-entrenched uh, group terrorists or otherwise. But, but given the track the that Israel is going, the path that Israel is, is going down, and it has said that without total victory, without the elimination of, of Hamas, there is no moving forward, there is no day after, how do you think they will stomach something like that? I think it's very, very difficult. I have seen the uh, compilation videos of what happened on that awful day of October the 7th. I've seen the horrors of what happened to Israelis on that day. I have met hostage families. I have total understanding, I believe, um, of the, the, the trauma that that's caused Israel. And it's widespread in Israel, and I'm not surprised. It's a shocker. But I would add that if you want to have safety and security with people who are going to inevitably continue to be your neighbor in some form or another, uh, you're going to have to create a relationship based on some shared values. And you don't easily do that without dialogue. Just finally, we have for the past few days been really focusing on the situation in Sudan, uh, a forgotten war. 
Just your thoughts on the fact that I know you mentioned it a few times in this interview, but this also is a conflict that, as you've rightly mentioned, the world is looking away from, doesn't realise is still continuing. And again, no truce in sight and a humanitarian situation that is spiralling out of control. I'm really glad you covered Sudan. I think that is exemplary and is wonderful that you've done so because with international attention comes uh, help for our operations, comes help for the people of Sudan. Sudan is a place where our absence of knowledge denies us a real sense of the extent of suffering. But we, the numbers tell the story. 25 million people need humanitarian assistance, 8 million people have left their homes, 10,000 cases of cholera and so forth. And as you say, barely any diplomacy. We need access and we've been trying very hard to get the two uh, militaries together again uh, to engage in planning on our own access planning, convoy routes and so forth. But what is most important for Sudan is activist diplomacy of the kind that we're seeing in Gaza, nearby. Let's have more active diplomacy as well as active access. Martin Griffiths, thank you so much uh, for your time. Thank you very much indeed.